breaking the wall of paraplegia. How neuroscience can help spinal and brain injured patients. Martin Schwab, Universität Zurich. Shortly after November 9th, I came to Berlin and walked through the former no man's land. We have heard about many types of walls today in this very unique and wonderful conference. The title of the session is Walls Around Our Minds. However, I would also like to talk about walls in our minds. The prejudices that we have, the dogmata to which we believe, often block us to see the right thing, block the progress in science, for instance. And my little story, which I'm going to tell you in the next 15 minutes or so, will start with such an observation where we were looking in the wrong direction for a long time and could not find the solution to something which seemed easy, as you will see. Paraplegia is an almost biblical paradigm for severe disease, for being extremely limited by not having um, control over one's body. You see Christopher Reeve here, Superman, and you see Paralympic, even children, uh, paraplegic uh, patients or paraplegic people uh, in the Olympic Games. The brain, of course, controls all our movements, and it does so by controlling the spinal cord, and the spinal cord has nerve cells which give off nerve processes which run to the muscles, and this is how we move. So in essence, you have the control centers in the brain, you have the executive centers in the spinal cord, and these are connected by wires which consist of millions of nerve fibers. The tract which coordinates our fine movements when you're writing, for instance, or now that I'm speaking, uh, consists of a few million nerve fibers. So <clears throat> this is our motor system, and the sensory system is very similar, where the sensory information coming from the periphery of our skin, of the muscles, of the intestines, and so on, and ascends to the brain through nerve fiber bundles with millions of nerve fibers. Spinal cord injury, of course, interrupts these bundles of nerve fibers, and this is what renders you paraplegic. <clears throat> so here you have an MR of a spinal injured patient. You see the brain, the spinal cord, and you see the injury site here where the spinal cord is severely disrupted. We have about 2,000 new cases every year in Germany and about 10 times more, 20,000 severe brain injuries which lead to neurological deficits, often extremely severe. Most of these um, Patients are young people because the accidents are traffic accidents, sports accidents, work accidents. Why is paraplegia, as I said, the biblical paradigm? Because it's lifelong, because you're in the wheelchair forever and the destiny sort of strikes in a particularly uh, devastating way. Why is it Lifelong. Why doesn't it, does it not repair itself? If you look at our body in a very general way, skin repairs itself very well. Muscle repairs itself very well. Liver, as some of you may know, you can cut off half of the liver. It regrows. You can take out one kidney, the other one grows and compensates. It's only the brain and the spinal cord which has lost uh, this uh, capacity. Why is this? So here <clears throat> you see this tract these one million nerve fibers which run down from the motor uh, centers of the forebrain into the spinal cord. And here they're interrupted by a section. This is an experimental animal. And we were teaching our students, medical students, biology students, for 80 years that there is no regrowth of these fibers. So if they are interrupted here, they do not grow down the spinal cord to the former target, targets anymore. So there's no regeneration and no repair, and therefore the deficits re uh, stay lifelong. <clears throat> this was the situation. Now, what can you do when you look at something like this from an experimental point of view? Of course, every graduate student can tell you that if the fibers don't grow, you just have to give them a growth factor, which makes them grow. 
So this is the first thing we tried 20 years ago at that time at the Max Planck Institute in Munich. We injected growth factors. There was no growth. So the system somehow didn't work. And the hypothesis, the theory, the dogma that it's a lack of growth factors which is responsible for the absence of regeneration. The theory was formulated first in 1911, so it was in the literature for 80 years. <clears throat> this theory must somehow have been wrong. We were looking around, and sort of the second side remark that I would like to make uh, after the balls in our mind is a side remark on the value of basic science. We're talking about a very applied question here. However, the solution came from a by chance observation in basic science. And here you see such an experiment. These are nerve cells, these bright spots here. <clears throat> and they sit on a culture dish, in the test tube, and have been fed growth factors. The culture dish has been coated before plating the cells with an extract of brain, spinal cord or brain, or with an extract of a peripheral nerve, a nerve from the leg, actually, of the, of the rat. Now you see that when you come back a day later, after you put the culture dish into the incubator, that these nerve cells have produced wonderful nerve fibers here. They grow very beautifully. If they can sit on a piece of peripheral nerve, or on an extract of peripheral nerve. However, if they sit on extracts from brain or spinal cord, they don't grow. So the dogma which we had to do away with was the dogma that growth cannot happen, and in fact a new concept evolved, which was the concept of neurite growth inhibitory factors. Factors which block growth. It took us three years to publish this concept because everybody says nobody has seen an inhibitory factor so far. What should, why should you have an inhibitory factor for nerve fiber growth in the brain or in the spinal cord and so on? So it's hard to overcome these walls, also in science. Nevertheless, in the end, we could do it. And again, in favor of basic science, in order to show and to prove that these factors actually exist, we had to use cell biology, biochemistry, molecular biology. We had to go through the entire purification procedure to show that these factors actually exist. Today, we know about a dozen of them, and one of them, which is called no way, is still the most potent one. And here you see a growing nerve fiber which grows happily on the cell culture dish, and it has sort of a hand uh, with which it uh, explores the territory. And then you add a little bit of this purified protein uh, called Nogue, and the whole thing collapses within seconds, and you end up with a very uh, uh, unhappy nerve fiber, which doesn't grow anymore. So this is a new concept, and a new uh, protein, in fact, a new protein family, which came up some 15 years ago. The question now is, how does this relate to the question we were asking at the beginning? Is such a factor responsible for the lack of regeneration of nerve fibers in the brain and in the spinal cord of experimental animals and ultimately of humans? <clears throat> and so in order to look at this, you have to be able to do away with this factor, to neutralize it or abolish it. And one way to do this is to produce antibodies. You have heard wonderful antibody talks this morning. You can produce antibodies against viruses or against bacteria. And the antibodies neutralize these viruses. You can also produce antibodies against proteins, proteins of the body. <clears throat> and these antibodies block the action of these proteins. And this is what this is. So here you have these nerve cells sustained in green this time, sitting on a culture dish which is coated with extract in this case, of monkey brain. And the nerve cells are unable to grow nerve fibers, although we stimulate them with goodies in the culture medium. When you incubate this culture dish with an antibody against this protein, Ogo A, they produce fibers overnight, so instantaneously. <clears throat> now, this is good news, because such an antibody can be produced in large amounts and can be applied to, for instance, animals. And this is, these are rats with a partial spinal cord injury, <clears throat> which disrupts the fine locomotor control, not the locomotion in general, but the fine locomotor control of these animals. 
<clears throat> and you see the tract which comes down from the brain and ends at the transection site here. And you have a little bit of what we call uh, uh, regenerative sprouting, a few fibers which form, but they don't do very much, as you can see. Now, you can implant these rats with a pump, which leads the antibody into the fluid which surrounds the spinal cord. These pumps are used already in humans for drugs, not for antibodies, but for drugs against pain, for instance, or spastic cramps. So this is what you see when you infuse an inactive control antibody, which doesn't do anything. This is what you see when you infuse an antibody against this protein, Novo A. The fibers now continue to grow. They grow around the scars, they grow down the spinal cords over long distances. They make nice arbors, and these arbors make connections to the nerve cells in the spinal cords which have survived the injury. The injury is very local here. There are many nerve cells down here. You can also uh, manipulate the mouse genetically and take this protein no away completely out. <clears throat> and you find that when you knock out no-go, that these nerve fibers can grow again down the spinal cord. So this is again a basic science experiment, which is an interesting proof of principle, which shows that these antibodies, or a completely different way of manipulating the mouse, actually works. So the key question is then, we get these fibers growing, regenerating after an injury over long distances. What do these fibers do? They may be lost. They may not know where to go. They may not be able to link up with target uh, cells in the spinal cord. After all, the system is very, very complex. <clears throat> millions of nerve fibers, millions of nerve cells. So we do behavioral experiments where we have the rats running around in an open field or trying to move in an open field. The rat is uh, paraplegic going over uh, grids, uh, narrow beams, swimming, and so on and so on. You can imagine that one can do a lot of things. I show you a single result here, and this is the narrow beam walking. Rats do this very well, of course. <clears throat> if you uh, transect their, uh, their motor command system in the spinal cord here, you see transection wound here, uh, <clears throat> the rats are completely unable to uh, walk over these beams. If you treat them with these antibodies for two weeks, the rats learn to go over these beams again. They don't do it very well. They slip off from time to time. Their motor control is not very good. However, it's very good as compared to these ones which can't do it at all. These types of experiments then led us to the outlook that we could apply these antibody treatments one day in human patients. And on the way to the human patient, because such a treatment has never been uh, used so far, <coughs> we used monkeys, very small numbers. But the monkey, of course, is an animal which is very close to humans, as we have heard this morning in uh, the first talk of the conference. So these are macaque monkeys. <coughs> they have a lateral transection here, which renders one hand and one arm plegic. So the animal has the arm like this. You see the command system from the brain, which is transected here. It sprouts a little bit, but doesn't do much. This is a control antibody treated animal. This is an anti nogo antibody treated animal, and you see again this regeneration response. So the fibers grow around the injury site, around the scar. They grow down the spinal cord over long distances. They find, wind their way down the spinal cord. They branch, and they find targets. And in fact, you can see the plegic hand of the control animal here and the open hand which uh, would be able to catch this food pellet which is thrown at the animal here uh, very precisely and very efficiently. And also in a number of other tests, we see recovery of function in a fantastic way. <clears throat> and this was the moment when drug companies, particularly Novartis, where clinicians heading big clinical centers all over the world and also where the uh, regulatory agencies thought that we should really move on to human patients. And this is where we are at the moment. So in uh, collaboration with Novartis and with the European and North American, uh, US and Canada clinical network, we are now applying these antibodies in freshly injured within two weeks after the accident paraplegic patients in a way which is very similar to the way in the rat. So a pump which, uh, or injections which apply the antibody into the human being. It's the first time that an antibody is applied towards uh, the spinal cord and into the brain. 
<clears throat> and the uh, result so far is that this antibody is extremely well tolerated in close to 60 patients now, and that we start to see uh, the first uh, result of such a treatment in, uh, uh, in uh, respect to functional improvements after the injury. <clears throat> of course, this is not only a story about uh, hitting uh, walls down or about basic science moving to its application. It's also a story about teamwork, uh, teams of international uh, cell biologists, molecular biologists, biochemists, and MDs, which work together uh, from time to time, gather somewhere in the Alps and Switzerland. And it's also a story about the collaboration of public funding, uh, like our university funding and the public uh, and EU networks, private funding, for instance, private foundations uh, which uh, fund uh, research in, this, in the area of spinal cord injury or brain damage, and also uh, pharma companies which help us to uh, bring this dream originally uh, into uh, application and into the patients. Thank you very much for your attention.